Hello and welcome to this review of my Maxi Switch Magnetic Read Keyboards. This is a pair of new old stock drop-in replacement modules. Both were donated by a viewer and they're quite interesting as they're a cool piece of Maxi Switch's history. Maxi Switch is a long-term keyboard manufacturer who are probably most well known for making the IBM Model M13 keyboard, which is notable for usually, but not always, coming in black rather than beige and having a track point 2 eraser head style pointing stick and mouse buttons. Another product they're well known for is the Gateway 2000 keyboards, including the Gateway Any Key, which is arguably the ultimate programmable vintage keyboard, which I hope to cover in a video in early 2019. Many, but not all, Gateway 2000 keyboards used Maxi Switch Dome with Slider switches, which are one of the few Dome with Slider designs I haven't reviewed yet on this channel, and the others are just standard rubber dome, so there's a lot of membrane in their history. At one point, they did make discrete mechanical switches, though. Some people know them from Maxi Switch Vintage Linear switches, which are one of the many clones of SMK Vintage Linear. Or the SMKs are the clones, or SMK or Maxi Switch made them both, who knows? However, what most people don't know is that Maxi Switch also used magnetic reed switches before that, and that's what these boards use. Magnetic reed switches use a set of two contacts which don't touch each other inside of a sealed glass bubble filled with an inert gas. When a magnet is brought near enough, the two contacts magnetize and pull towards each other, closing the circuit. Technically, reed switches can also work the other way around, being closed by default, but in keyboards such an arrangement is quite rare. Because of the inner atmosphere the contacts are housed in, they undergo virtually no oxidation when closing, which is normally the bottleneck that determines the lifetime of metal contact switches. The lifetime of reed switches depends a bit on the voltages they experience, but for the 5 volt range, it's generally in the billions, making these some of the most reliable keyboard switches ever made. The catalogue only specifies a lifetime of greater than 100 million cycles, but testing even just that already takes ages, so they probably just cut it off there like some other companies do nowadays. In fact, according to this really cool electronic design issue from 1979, while Hall Effect keyboards are at the top of the technological pecking order, keyboards based on reed switches are right on the heels of Hall Effect switches in terms of longevity. Magnetic reed keyboard switches were particularly popular in the Eastern Bloc, with varying levels of success and smoothness, but Fujitsu, Microswitch and even Keytronic made some as well. Speaking of Keytronic, similar to how Maxi Switch Vintage Linear are virtually identical to SMK Vintage Linear except for the Maxi branding and different colour scheme, these Maxi Switch Magnetic Reed switches appear to be identical to Keytronic Magnetic Reed switches except for Maxi branding and a different colour scheme. The smaller one has a date stamp from 1984, which is extremely late, but they already did them at least as early as 1973, as you can see from this ad in Electronic Design magazine, where they also show what appears to be their vintage linear switches. Considering Keytronic magnetic reed keyboards are also predominantly from the 70s, I'm not really sure who copied who, or alternatively, it's possible that one manufactured the switches for both companies. That said, there are minor differences and they use completely different keycaps, so I'd say it's a clone. They're not the only clones either. Someone recently brought a keyboard with, again almost completely identical switches, this time CRC branded, to the community's attention. So how did the Maxi Switch mag reads feel? Well, like KT mag reads, they're fairly stiff linear switches, actuating at 70 grams according to an old Maxi Switch catalogue. Bizarrely, at the time, 70 grams of actuation force, so not even bottom out weight, was apparently considered feather light according to another piece I found. Because mag reads are contactless, they have the potential to be highly smooth, but as many of the Soviet block ones demonstrate, this is definitely not always the case. Now, as both of these are new old stock and presumably have never been used, which makes sense as they're absolutely spotlessly clean, you'd expect them to be the best they have to offer, and I say it's okay, there is definitely some friction, but it's in more of a buttery way than being really scratchy, so to speak. In fact, the combination of the dairiness, relatively long 4.3mm travel, and the stiff weighting as well as the deep sound gives it a very meaty feel to use these, I think. They're quite cool, I mean I don't think I'd like to use these as a daily driver, but they're definitely fun and satisfying to try out. 
Just like KT mag reads, they use a somewhat weird soldering method. The contacts poke downward through a communal hole in the PCB and are bent outward and then soldered. At first I was wondering why they would do that, but then I saw this catalog entry where they stated that the reads are field replaceable and can be taken from the back of the circuit board, which makes sense. Now the maxi switch boards are so incredibly glazed in solder mask that I think removing anything will make a big mess, so I didn't try it, besides I don't like to fuck around too much with new old stock keyboards. But I tried it with KT mag reads which aren't a solder mask and yeah it actually works, that's really cool. Just like the KT and CRC magnetic reads, the switches are held to the PCB externally, but instead of the bolts that the KT and CRC version uses, it uses screws on the maxi switch keyboards instead. And again, just like KT and CSE mag reads, they came in these really weird blocks ranging from single switches to rows of up to six switches. This was called a modular design by maxi switch, but I'm not sure that modular is the word I'd apply here. In the case of the, well, let's call them F keys, even though they actually read L, whatever that means, they used a block housing and then they didn't put a switch in each of them because the keycaps are one and a half units wide, which leads to this really weird asymmetrical mount with no stabilizers. They still go down okay, sorta, kinda on most of the switches, but others bind pretty badly as rather inconsistent. I'd say it's overall not a very good idea, they'd have been better off not cheapening out and just using single switches and center mount keys here instead. Speaking of the layout, so one of them is this rather small, almost TKL-like thing with, for the early 80s, not even that much weird stuff on it. I mean, it uses a cross nav with some weird legends here and there, such as the good old rub out key, and the main block has a fuck ton of strange sub legends, and the escape key is one row down below an at sign, etc., but it's otherwise not too outlandish. I'm sure someone could make something pretty workable out of it. The other one is much bigger and is possibly the weirdest layout I've ever seen on a computer keyboard and with all the shit I've been reviewing, that's saying something. First of all, it doesn't even use QWERTY, it uses a simple alphabetical order, which is so weird to type on, and it doesn't even use 11 or so characters per row, but 6, and it's ortholinear, but on the other hand that probably does mean it's ultra ergonomic or something. Apart from the 15 enigmatic L keys at the top, there's also 16 D keys, whatever they might have done, a cross nav with a whatever key in the center, a jump key, and a whole bank of symbols. There is no shift key on the keyboard, so you can't use a shift layer over other keys to access these, I guess. Apart from the colorless solder mask that the entire board and all the electronic components are absolutely drenched in, they certainly didn't cheap out on that, the boards are completely bare bones. I suspect that they were originally housed in a metal enclosure of some kind. In fact, although I haven't been able to find what computer the small board came from, the big one appears to be, apart from using slightly less excitingly colored keycaps, identical to the keyboard that came with the Foxbro Fox 3 process control computer, which itself was a rebadged ADDS ruggedized terminal. As you can see from this picture, it seems to have come with a pretty beefy case. The big one uses metal retainers at the side and metal rails at the bottom as well, while the smaller one is just a PCB. The little one weighs 750 grams while the big one comes in at 1550, not bad for a keyboard in a nude. Although Maxi Switch is most well known for making keyboards in Mexico, these ones are still made in the USA and it looks like it's hand traced as well. The keycaps are, as mentioned, different from the Keytronic ones, although they use the same mount and they're interchangeable. The molding marks on the inside leads me to believe these caps may have been manufactured by CompTech, but I'm not sure. The biggest difference is the key stem, which has very thin walls on the maxi switch version, and on almost all the keycaps are removed from these boards, a part of the stem immediately broke off. So either the plastic has become brittle over the years, which is possible, I mean it's been well over 30 years, or the keycaps just kind of suck. They still stick on fine though, the plungers wobble a fair bit, but the keycaps don't. This is probably because they actually click into the sliders using pips in the keycap stems. I think it's the unclipping that breaks these stems off too. Which is a shame because I think they look pretty cool even though they're a very simple grey colour. In fact, they appear to be the original CompTech SA series keycaps from before CompTech was bought out and reformed as signature plastics in 2001. The series was originally flat and uniprofile, like the ones on these maxi switch boards, but eventually they made them sculpted. The third row caps remain identical to the old original ones though. 
Anyway, concluding, it's a pretty interesting pair of keyboards. The switches are not my favorite, but I think the heavy-handed people that like linears might well like them, and they look and sound pretty cool. Besides, they're super reliable, and I think the small one especially might make a cool TKL project, considering it's got a pretty usable-looking layout. That's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me first typing on the TKL and then attempting to type on the ABC keyboard.